State Bar. He's practiced criminal law for over 30 years in federal, state, and municipal courts. He's also a nationally and internationally known speaker and author on trial advocacy, immigration law, and history of the Bill of Rights. But of course, today he's going to talk about a different amendment than in the Bill of Rights. So um, we want to welcome Mr. Robert J. McWhorter. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Have we got my screen share on? Um, let's see. I don't see it on. So the host is disabled participant screen share. And I think you, Oliver, I think you need to. Yeah, Oliver has to work on that. Okay. It says, it says you are the host now. I just need so your you host, able... uh, so you can. Okay. So I can, oh, here we go. Okay. Share. All there right. We there we go. Okay. Well, very good. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, so I assume everybody can see this screen, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I have, um, I've been speaking a lot. No. What's that? No, sir, excuse me. I'm blind. Could you please oh. uh, describe certain things for me? I'm a blind participant. Thank you. I'd be happy to. Thank you for telling me. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you go along in life and ask normal questions and then realize you ask a question that might have been insensitive. So I apologize. Uh, thank you for telling me. Um, all right. What I have right now is a screen, uh, the beginning and the, t the title of this talk is uh, the 19th Amendment, Making America into Herself. Um, I'm actually kind of glad to be speaking on this topic. I've been asked to speak recently this week about three different times, uh, some major presentations on Donald Trump and the Constitution and everything's going on. And, and frankly, I'm just happy to get a break from Donald Trump. And let's go back to. <laughs> so um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. America began with these words. If you want to say, where did America begin? It begins here. These words. The Declaration of Independence founded us on equality rather than ethnicity, liberty rather than race. The United States remains one of the few, if not the only country that's founded on a creed, not a common heritage, ethnicity, or ruling political religious elite. Our national identity is not defined in religious or ethnic terms, nor is our nationally national identity defined by gender. Gender does not define our national identity. What defines our national identity is adherence to this creed. We hold these men, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, okay? This, we hold these truths to be self-evident that, that all men are created equal leads directly to the 19th Amendment. It is the 19th Amendment uh, with the arc of history and justice, it is the natural progression. The 19th Amendment reads, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Fundamentally different kind of structure of federalism with that last clause, which is the same as in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And what it is, is the natural progression from America's foundation. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, is what Jefferson wrote. It included women too, even in 1776. Now, just in case anybody ever wonders who's the geekiest person in the room, I will lay claim to that title. I actually looked up a grammar from 1745, Ann Fisher, A Practical New Grammar. Um, it was new in 1745, at least. And what it says is, prescribe the generic he as the gender neuter singular pronoun, which is the same as it is today, actually. Thus, all men meant all women too, even in 1776. Now, obviously, it was all men who approved the Declaration of Independence and who signed it. But in terms of that declaratory statement when you say all men are, are, are created equal, you have to get to the point where it means all women as well, just as a matter of English grammar. 
English doesn't have gender case, it's the best we can do with the language. So all men created equal means women too, even for Thomas Jefferson. Remember the ladies. Abigail Adams writes John Adams in March 31st, 1776. It was a charming letter. I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. If peculiar care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to ferment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have not voice or representation. Now, John was accustomed to often listening to what Abigail Adams said and her advice. Unfortunately, on this instance, he did not listen to Abigail. And of course, the founders of the Constitution did not give women the right to vote or have political voice. Uh, if you remember the miniseries John Adams with Lori Lindy, Laura Lindy playing Abigail Adams, that gives you a good sense of what's going on with John. I think you could trace the beginning of the Me Too movement to this letter from Abigail Adams to John, okay, us two. In 1789, all men created equal manifest itself in the constitution of we the people. We the people, that's how our document defining our government begins, we the people. It is not we the states. It is not we the white male Protestants. It is not even we the citizens. It is we the people. Just as a matter of English grammar, the people means everybody, even if you're a non-citizen and, of course, even if you are a woman or not a Protestant. We the people are the first and last words of the Constitution. Uh, I believe that you should count the Bill of Rights as part of the original Constitution. It was passed by the same people. And the last words of the Tenth Amendment, which was the original Bill of Rights, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited it, uh, to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. We the people begins, we the people ends the Constitution. But unfortunately in American history, certain people were not recognized as the people in 1789. Black people, Native Americans, women, and poor folk. Throughout our history, we have both risen to the ideal, all people are created equal, and almost at the same time failed to meet its aspiration. In some ways, we're very unique in having the ideal, and that's important, but it's always a struggle to meet that aspiration. The framers of our Constitution failed. They failed to live up to their own words. Because although the Constitution and bodies created equal and the people, the framers failed to resolve the conflict between freedom and slavery. And it was slavery by race and slavery by gender. Uh, this is a painting uh, recently found, but it dates to the period of Virginia luxuries. You have basically violence occurring in both parts of this panel. Because the women who were essentially coerced by slavery into sexual relationships had no choice in the matter. That is the working definition of rape. And American slavery, in addition to being an economic reality, in very large part was sexual slavery. If you look at the DNA makeup of an average black person in America, that person has about one fourth white blood, one fourth European blood. 74% uh, Sub-Saharan, Native Americans, and other. So about a quarter of that. Now that is the result, and, and you can go back in history and say that there may have been real love relationships and some of these relationships between black and white people going on. It was principally the product of rape, um, at least what we would today call statutory rape because you have one party that was in no position to legally consent one way or the other or object. So, aristocracy or republic. Now, a good portion of this talk, I am going to talk about slavery, but then there is a definite tie-in to this reality and the struggle of women to get the vote and how this coalesces into uh, making America into herself. So if you just bear with me a little bit on there, I, I think this talk will get there, right? Aristocracy or republic, we the people versus sexism and a slaveocracy. We take it for granted today that the founding fathers wanted to create a democratic republic. 
Uh, that was actually not the case with many of them. Uh, many of the founding fathers intended to create an aristocracy. Aristocracy and slavery are symbiotic. Um, and the big struggles they had in the initial founding of this country was that dynamic. Many of the slaveocracy merely wanted to get rid of Great Britain so that they could be on top of an aristocracy, not that they were necessarily adherents or actual kind of committed to the idea of a republic. John Adams, all our misfortunes arise from a single source, the reluctance of the Southern colonies to Republican government. So John Adams recognizes this immediately. James Madison wrote about this extensively. Now, James Madison is one of these interesting Virginians who are aristocrats, but also committed to Republican principles. James Madison, of course, was a big slaveholder. It allowed for his lifestyle, but he is committed to the idea of Republicanism. In proportion as slavery prevails in a state, the government, however democratic in name, must be aristocratic in fact. The inexorable result of a high density of slaves was the concentration of ruling power in a minority. With slavery, republicanism is fallacious. Uh, fallacious, uh, fallacious, <laughs> fallacious. The states were divided into different interests, not by size, but principally from their having or not having slaves. So from the very early days of the Republic, this problem of slavery is recognized as the cause of division in the United States. Now, how does slavery and freedom tie in with the 19th Amendment's history and foundation? Aristocracy was principally placed in the Southern male paternalistic culture. Now, of course, there is injustices done with women in the North as well. There's no question about that, and racial injustice in the North as well. But you had a culture of Southern male paternalism. Women, children, and slaves were all dependent on men, legally and culturally. You have the image of the Southern Belle versus the reality of poor women in an economically depressed South. Southern women lacked political rights. Now, there is no question that black and white women have different social status in the South. But, and, and by the way, the South is not unique regarding race and sex discrimination by any means. But Southern white women had the same political status as slaves. They didn't have the right to vote or the right to hold office or essentially the right to any civil rights that we take for granted today, including really the right to broad freedom of speech. So they had no political difference than slaves. They were all dependent in this culture of Southern male paternalism. If you look at the amount of suffrage going on just before the passage of the 19th Amendment, which happens August 18th, 1920, this is a map of how many states had already given women the right to vote. In the West, you have full suffrage. Okay, you've got a new kind of image going on in the West. In the middle countries, states, you have presidential, municipal, school board suffrage. Women were allowed to vote in those areas, but of course not in national elections. In principally the states of the old Confederacy, women lack voting rights, and that's concentrated in the South before the passing of the 19th Amendment. It's the Southern states that maintained this culture of paternalism for the most part, and that goes all the way back to their founding culture. By the way, just for curiosity, the first state to recognize women had the right to vote was, of course, Wyoming. Now, we don't think of Wyoming as a terribly progressive place these days. It definitely is in the red column in the political calculus for, for presidency. Uh, the reason women got the right to vote first in Wyoming is they needed, they didn't have enough population to justify statehood. So because you couldn't count the cows and sheep, you had to count women too and give women the right to vote in order to have enough people of, 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 of correct age to vote to qualify for statehood to come in the United States. So that's Wyoming becomes the first state that grants women the right to vote. All right, so you've got the nature of the constitution, all these things bubbling around. We the people versus a covenant for death, uh, uh, with death. And the question was, is our constitution really about freedom and rights or not? 
Is it a sexist and slave constitution or is it not? William Lloyd Garrison, uh, circa 1850, this picture starts the liberator. Uh, he starts the anti-slavery society. He calls for the North to secede from the Union before the South ever does it. No union with slaveholders and the constitution is a pro-slavery covenant with death and agreement with hell. And if you look at the history, there's a lot of good arguments that are made that if the North would have seceded from the South, slavery would have collapsed because slavery and the slave power needed the power and scope of the federal government to maintain the institution of slavery in the South. If you look at the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9 continues the importation uh, clause, importation of Africans to, um, to America for slavery. There's the Fugitive Slave Clause, the Three-Fifths Clause, which many people have heard of. Of these, the Fugitive Slave Clause was crucial to maintaining slavery because it required the non-slave states to return any escaped slaves back into bondage. Um, and again, the argument was that if it wouldn't have been for this, all the slave had to do was flee to the border states and then the border states, the Northern states, and they would have had to be returned. A lot of slaves that went through the Underground Railroad, of course, had to go all the way to Canada to be really protected from being returned by the power of the federal government, the national government, back into bondage. Okay, these clauses exist, and yet there is the seed for something greater. Sure, the framers failed, but I argue that although they failed, they created in the Constitution the mechanism for a broader scope of understanding of rights. For the first thing, the Constitution did not just create a national republic. It required all states to have a republican form of government. Now, this repudiates any legal acceptance of an aristocratic America. Now, of course, southern states were, in, in, in reality, rep um, aristocratic. They were slave power. But at least there wasn't a legal justification for it. The foundation of the country did not allow for that. Um, in Federalist number 39, slaveholding James Madison writes, the national and states governments were Republican because our political institutions were established on the basis of human rights and framed for their preservation. Okay. Second, the word slave never appears in our constitution, uh, at least not until the 13th Amendment. Instead, the constitution used other persons, such persons or persons held in service or labor. Slaves are persons. Now, they're not persons with full political rights, I grant you, but the, they are persons. And when you have a constitution of we the people, you cannot suffer this contradiction forever. Abraham Lincoln made this very point in the Copper Union speech uh, in the 27th of February, 1860. Now, this is the speech that launches him as a national political contender for the presidency. Neither the word slave nor slavery is found in the Constitution. And wherever in that instrument the slave is alluded to, he is called a person. This mode of alluding to slaves and slavery was employed on purpose to exclude from the Constitution the idea that there could be property in man. Now, where does this come from? This is Gruvener Morris. He's known as the penman of the Constitution, one of the few delegates of uh, Philadelphia who openly opposed slavery. Upon what principle is it that the slaves shall be uh, computed in the representation? Are they men that make them citizens and let them vote? Morris was the one who wrote the Constitution's preamble, beginning with the words, we the people. I think what Morris and people like him did is they knew they couldn't get the full understanding of rights that the Constitution was meant to encompass. So they laid the groundwork. They laid the foundation, we the people. Morris knew that we the people followed the declarations, all men are created equal. A constitution of equally created people cannot perpetually suffer slavery's contradiction nor perpetually suffer the contradiction of women without vote or political power. The seed Morris and others planted eventually allowed Lincoln to connect the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution with the Gettysburg Address. Now you could divide up the Gettysburg Address point by point on this, but I'm only gonna take a couple examples. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition 
that all men are created equal. Okay, right there, he's tying that back in with all men are created equal. Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence. Now, he ends the De uh, Gettysburg Address with, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. At the end, he ties that in to the United States Constitution, we the people. The Gettysburg Address is irrefutable as far as a declaration of what America means. If you ask, what does America mean? People say, oh, with America, we have freedom. This is the articulation. If you want to argue against the Declaration of Independence as a founding understanding of America, you're essentially defining yourself as a racist. To deny it is indeed the working definition of racism. Universal freedom is a democratic republic's prerequisite. If you don't have universal freedom, you cannot continue and have a true democratic republic. And Abraham Lincoln articulated that, and James Madison would have understood the exact same thing. And Gouverneur Morris gave us the tools to have this happen. What happened after, of course, Abraham Lincoln gets murdered is amendments cement this vision. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. The 14th Amendment includes the Privileges and Immunities Clause, Due Process Clause, and Equal Protection Clause, which actually defines slaves as citizens, not just and slavery, but defines slaves as and all people as citizens. Um, and then the 15th Amendment grants voting right regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The 19th Amendment follows this same expansion, this expansive vision of all men and women are created equal. Okay. Universal freedom is now our national aspiration and ideal. Freedom is America. And when people say freedom is America, this is what we're talking about. It's not the freedom to go to Walmart and buy whatever you want. It is this, this ideal, this creed. This is a 1942 war poster. To exclude one group is the foundation of totalitarianism. This world cannot exist half free, uh, slave and half free. Again, invoking back to Abraham Lincoln's speech, fight for freedom. That's the purpose for which we entered the Second World War. Okay. Um, is there any questions at this point? I can keep, I mean, I'll go on here in a moment, but I like to, since we're on Zoom, I have to be more formal about asking um, if there's any questions. Okay. There's nothing in the chat. I don't see any hands raised either. So it doesn't look like we have any. Okay. So if anybody has questions, uh, type them into the chat. And I'll, I'll give time, of course, at the end for, for any questions people have. So, all right, because obviously I'm not there and I can't see somebody raise a hand to, to, to have a question. So this is the best we can do in the Zoom world. So I'm going to go on to the next section, freedom and slavery, uh, freedom and the struggle against slavery and sexism. Seneca Falls Convention, 1848. Uh, there, there was produced the Declaration of Sentiments. Uh, it was patterned off of Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. And there was a big argument there about whether women should push, uh, push for full suffrage. Resolved that it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. Now, this resolution was hotly debated. Um, we would find it absurd that that would be even in question, but this is what we debated. Is now the time to push for this? Frederick Douglass was there. Now, remember, Frederick Douglass at this point does not have, he, he has escaped from bondage himself, but he does not have full freedom to vote. Um, and he speaks eloquently in favor of this resolution. And what he says is, I cannot accept the right to vote as a black man if women cannot also claim that right. The world would be a better place if women were involved in the political sphere. In this denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of women and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens, but the maiming and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power of the government of the world. Okay, so you've got this connection and this, all of this struggle leads eventually to the 13th Amendment 
the 13th Amendment ended legal slavery. Now, the 13th Amendment has many fathers, Thaddeus Stevens, um, Lyman Turnbull, James Ashley, Henry Wilson, Charles Sumner, Abraham Lincoln, of course, is depicted in the movie uh, Lincoln with Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, very, very good movie um, that, that was essentially historically accurate. And it also had mothers, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were the mothers of the 13th Amendment. They were actively involved and they had a prominent role in abolition and they didn't stop there. They saw the commonality of the struggle against slavery and sexism. All must be we the people or no one is. Now, what they had done was Anthony and Stanton and the Women's National Loyal League coordinated a campaign for the 13th Amendment's passage. It was the largest petition drive to that point in congressional history. They collected nearly 400 signatures to abolish slavery. Now, 400,000 signatures to us doesn't seem that big a deal. 400,000 signatures back in 1865 is huge. I mean, it's not like you can just go on a, you know, what do I want to say, like a GoFundMe page and get a bunch of people to sign up. They had to coordinate. They had to organize all this thing. And they deposited a petition with 400,000 signatures for the passage of the 13th Amendment. Anthony and Stanton later took the struggle to fight for the 19th Amendment. Now, Louise May Alcock um, was a Civil War nurse. She was involved in the women's suffrage movement. Uh, she was the first woman to register to vote in Concord, Massachusetts. In Little Women, the father is away as a sergeant in the Union Army fighting against slavery. Little Women and its sequels were a great literary success and made Louisa May Alcock quite wealthy. In the 1930 film with Katherine Hepburn as Joe March, I'm sorry, whenever I like read Little Women or think of it, it's always Katherine Hepburn voice that kind of pops in there for me. I know there's been other productions of it, but it's got to be Katherine Hepburn, but all right. I find it poor logic to say that because women are good, women should vote. Men do not vote because they are good, they vote because they are male. And women should vote not because we are angels and men are animals, but because we are human beings and citizens of this country. Okay. So this is a contemporary voice going on. At the time, the country is fighting against slavery and connecting these issues with ending sexism. So jump around here. The 19th Amendment, of course, gets passed in 1920. There are legal challenges, quote unquote, to the 19th Amendment. Um, this is, um, okay, April 20, August 26, 1920. Two months later, Judge Oscar Lesser sues to stop two women from registering to vote in, in Maryland. Now, the arguments he uses are basically the same arguments that were used against the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments as well. The case is Lesser versus Garnett, uh, decided in 1922. He essentially proposes a state's rights argument. Maryland Constitution limited the suffrage to men. Maryland has not ratified the 19th Amendment. Therefore, why should Maryland register these women to give them the right to vote? Okay. The 19th Amendment destroyed state autonomy by increasing Maryland's electorate without state consent. Okay. Now, first of all, if you think that argument, first of all, there are certain issues where state autonomy after the Civil War Amendments and after the 19th Amendment do not matter. Because remember that clause, Congress shall have the power to make this, implement this by appropriate legislation. The other thing that's kind of interesting about this is usually states want to increase their electorate. They want to increase their power in the electoral college. Okay, and also the number of representatives they get in Congress. This is an utterly self-defeating argument for the interests of a state. But this is the argument because I mean, in his mind, giving women the right to vote has got to be worse than that, right? Now, let's just talk a little bit about these states' rights arguments. States' rights ain't right. Now, states' rights is the argument that states have rights over the federal government, and there's claims of 10th Amendment legitimacy. Uh, George Wallace, at his inaugural address, says, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. I'm not even going to try to do the accent, the Alabama accent. What he later said was, I should have said states' rights now, states' rights tomorrow, states' rights forever. Okay, 
It's argued yet today, Ted Nugent, because our legislative, judicial, and executive branches of government hold the Tenth Amendment in contempt, I'm beginning to wonder if it would not have been best had the South won the Civil War. Okay. I got to tell you, that's just a horrible thing to say. It's horrible. All right, but let's go on. This is a symbol of courage and honor in fighting for states' rights and rebellion against federal overreach. Okay, this is just the lost cause mythology. This is a false narrative that's been, been allowed to perpetuate in, in American history ever since the end of Reconstruction. This is simply wrong. Historically, it is wrong. It's not what was happening in the least. And as I'm gonna show here, the South and the slave power hated the idea of states' rights before the Civil War. They didn't want states' rights in the least. The reality is that before the Civil War, the South opposed states' rights. Now, if you recall, I mentioned uh, the Fugitive Slave Clause, Article 4, Section 2. It was followed by implementing legislation, the Fugitive Slaves Acts of 1793 and the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. It used all the mechanisms of the federal government against states in order to perpetuate slavery. It was in response to these acts that several Northern states passed what were called personal liberty laws to protect their black citizens from kidnapping. There was the importation clause uh, in the constitution, which basically went out in 1808. After 1808, importation of slaves became illegal. So in order to meet the demand of the slave powers agricultural interests, they went to slave catchers, which kidnapped runaway slaves, but they also kidnapped free black people. Salmon Northrop's um, autobiography, 12 Years a Slave, which is recently made into a very good movie, depicts this is a free man who was kidnapped by slave catchers to be sent south into bondage. All right. The South viewed the Northern personal liberty laws as a refusal to uphold the Fugitive Slave Act and that was a violation of the federal constitution. South Carolina Senator John C. Calhoun, okay, the one who gave the theoretical underpinnings for the Confederacy and the argument about dual nullification and all these other kinds of arguments, uh, dual sovereignties and et cetera, to perpetuate slave powers interest rights. The new personal liberty laws rendered slave property utterly insecure. They are a flagrant violation of the spirit of the US constitution. Okay, what is he arguing there? He is arguing that states' rights should not be respected in the least. Prig versus Pennsylvania, personal liberty laws are unconstitutional. Edelman, Edelman versus Bose upheld the conviction of uh, a Northern person for helping a slave to escape, okay? This is the Taney Supreme Court decides these decisions on the basis of national power over states' rights and this is the court that eventually decides the Dred Scott case in 1857. The reality is Southern slave power blocked states' rights for Northern states. They didn't want states' rights in the least. Now, there's an interesting irony because this is a depiction of federal marshals enforcing the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act what the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 did was it created a precedent for federal courts, federal marshals to be involved in the capturing of slaves. But that same precedent justified after the passing of the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment, federal courts and federal court marshals to be involved in the, in the increasing of civil rights, in the civil rights movement. This is Norman Rockwell's painting uh, the problem we all live with. You've got four federal marshals escorting a little girl. And if you look closely at this, I think Norman Rockwell is a bit underappreciated as a commentator on social reality. You have a horrible word um, kind of spray painted on the wall. You've got tomatoes being thrown. You've got the marshals in lockstep. And in the center of the picture, what do you got? You got a little girl with her ruler and her notebook, and she just wants to go to school. You kind of lose sight of the fact that at the bottom line is it's just a little girl wants to go to school. Why could that possibly be so the cause of such fear and hatred? So 
The Fugitive Slave Act 1850 set the precedent for expanded federal power at the expense of state sovereignty on issues of racial equality. And that is a good thing. States' rights to justify barring the doors for segregation. If you remember in the movie Forrest Gump, um, they inserted him here in this uh, scene uh, with Governor Wallace trying to block the doors uh, for a uh, desegregation. Hubert Humphrey in 18, uh, 1948 told the Southern delegates to get out of the shadow of states' rights and walk forthrightly into the sunshine of human rights. Now, here's these claims. Remember the 10th Amendment, states have rights too. Okay, that is simply wrong. States do not have rights. States have powers. States have sovereignty, and, and often it's sovereignty much broader than the federal government, all right? Only individuals have rights. The federal government has powers. The federal government has sovereignty. And federalism is working these two things out between the two, but it's individuals that have rights not governments. We the people is what the Constitution says. So going back to this, right? It is we the people that matter. Now, what is it that actually the Ninth Amendment says? What the Ninth Amendment says is the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. It doesn't say anything about states' rights in the least. What the Tenth Amendment says is the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. That's the 10th Amendment that they talk about, right? So what do we have here? Rights are retained by the people. Powers are reserved to the states or to the people. States don't have rights. People have rights. What the 9th and 10th Amendment really do is advance a radical idea. Individual rights are universal. States don't have rights, only people have rights, okay? So forget Ted. All right, so what happens back in Lesser versus Garnett? The Supreme Court unanimously upheld the 19th Amendment. Uh, Justice Louis Brandeis, one of the greats of the Supreme Court writes that the ratification is a federal function from the Constitution, Article 5, not subject to state limitations. The 19th Amendment was worded like the 15th Amendment, which had expanded state electorates without regard to race for over 50 years, despite Maryland rejecting it. All right, same thing's true for the 19th Amendment. So we the people is including all of us. We the people used to mean white males, okay? The universal view of the people is the modern challenge. And that's the challenge that we still face every day. The ultimate purpose of all this is something that the framers knew. As Justice Hugo Black wrote in 1960, loyalty comes from love of good government, not fear of a bad one. The framers knew that the Constitution and America had to grow into herself. Fighting for the right to be people. The 19th Amendment is an indispensable part of this growth. It's the same as the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, as I've mentioned. Fighting for the right to the, be the people. The Declaration of Independence did not pronounce, pronounce no new rights because rights are self-evident. Suffrage, the civil rights movement, was about not about creating rights, but getting them recognized. No new rights were created. It was getting them recognized. America remains a vision of freedom for all people exercising that freedom in a democratic republic. And by the way, just for information's sake, the people were there all along. It's one of my favorites. Friedrich Wilhelm Augustin Ludolf Gerhard von Steuben, Baron von Steuben, it's also pronounced von Steuben. Okay. This guy was a Prussian military officer. He taught the Continental Army to drill, stand, shoot, and fight with a bayonet. He wrote the Revolutionary War Manual. He spoke very little English and often told his translator, here, come, swear for me, all right? Um, he was the one who stayed with Washington during Valley Forge, during that horrible cold winter, and trained the army to actually stand and fight. Despite all the problems of Valley Forge, because of Baron von Steuben, that army came out better than when it entered into Valley Forge, okay? 
That's why he gets his own postage stamp. You got to be important if you're going to get a postage stamp. All right. Do you remember in the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Remember the parade that Ferris crashes during his day off? That's the Von Steuben Day Parade or Von Steuben Day Parade in Chicago. Okay, that's how important this guy is. All right. He was gay. He was homosexual. This is one of the sides of the Lafayette Manual, uh, Monument outside of the White House, okay? And this is the panel dedicated to von Steuben. Uh, he had left Prussia because he was charged with sexual liaison with, with young men, basically young officers, okay? Whoever did this statue kind of was hip to something, all right? This man was instrumental to America winning the Revolutionary War. Crispus Attox was the man killed in the Boston Massacre. He is of African American and Native American heritage. James Fortine fought honorably during the Revolutionary War, came back, opened a shipyard, employed dozens of black and, and white people in his shipyard, um, and died a wealthy man. Um, Peter Salem shoots Major Pitcairn during the Battle of Bunkle Hill, a black man there fighting with everybody else. The people were there fighting all along. James Robinson, uh, one of more than 5,000 Black people who fought in the Revolutionary War and several thousand in the War of 1812, a veteran, Black man. This is a depiction, of course, Molly Pitcher, whose nickname of a woman who fought in the American Battle of Monmouth. Uh, it was probably a composite of many women, wives, nurses, prostitutes, et cetera, who were there fighting for American Revolution. Uh, the way they fought, who knows? But the point is, they were there and fighting as much as the men. Betsy Ross made the symbol of we the people in the American flag. Now, look, a lot of these stories were created afterwards, like two generations by descendants. Did this whole thing really happen? You don't really have documentary evidence, but really who cares? The point is Betsy Ross made the symbol of freedom. Cokie Roberts' Founding Mothers is a great book, kind of briefly laying out the contributions that women made, including Abigail Adams. But as with the old debate of Republican aristocracy, we still have this debate, Republicanism or aristocracy. There remains the argument of we the people, the symbol, illegals have no rights. I'm sorry, that is simply wrong. It is we the people, not we the citizens. There remains a vision of two Americas. One is dedicated to the proposition that all people are created equal. This is an expansive view of America. It's an America is a big country of universal rights with an inclusive constitution. The other is a limited America. Citizens and boundaries are strict. Some people are inferior. Christians only, Jews not apply. Uh, no Jews, dogs, black people, Irish need not apply, Chinese must go, return to sender, we serve whites only and no Spaniards or Mexicans, borders closed now, illegal immigration, whatever, stop. We're still working with these, this dichotomy. The irony of American history is that Americans' creed is most devoted adherents are often those historically denied its promises. Black Americans did not abandon liberal democracy because of slavery, Jim Crow, and the systematic destruction of whatever wealth they managed to accumulate. Instead, they took up arms in two world wars to defend it. This uh, movie, Negro Soldier, is an interesting movie from um, World War II. You can get it, um, I think it's public domain, you can get it on YouTube. It's worth watching, despite the kind of outdated language. America is great because Japanese Americans did not reject liberal democracy because of internment or the racist humiliation of Asian exclusion. This is the Boy Scouts at the Grenada War Relocation Center raising the American flag half master in a memorial service for the first six soldiers from that center killed in action in Italy. And this happens on August 5th, 1944. These people are in an internment camp and the Boy Scouts are still adhering to the ideals of America. 
The 442nd Infantry Regiment, the Gopher Broke, Purple Heart Battalion in Italy, roughly 3,000 soldiers saw action, 93% official casualty rate. There's a speculation that was actually 314%. Now, the reason why you can have a higher than 100% casualty rate is because soldiers would get wounded and they would hobble back to the line and get wounded again and counted twice. And that happened numerous times, multiple woundings. 21 medals of honor, 9,486 Purple Hearts. Meanwhile, their family, for the most part, are back in internment camps in the United States. They did not give up on American democracy and our democratic republic. If you recall Mr. Miyagi from the Karate Kid movies, a fictional character, but he had a Purple Heart and the presumption was he was part of the 442nd Regiment. Women did not abandon the vision that they are the we the people as well. I found a lot of the um, kind of um, campaign to get the um, 19th Amendment passed. Here's a, here's a vote for women card and poster for the work of the day, for the taxes we pay, for the uh, laws we obey. We want something to say is what the card is with a little girl talking to a little boy. Very clever and diffusing saw a lot of the violence and hostility <clears throat> that women suffered just because they were asking for the right to vote. Women did not give up until the 19th Amendment helped America grow into herself. The 19th Amendment keeps the promise. And I will quote here from Abraham Lincoln because I consider myself a good writer and good writers always steal from better writers. Abraham Lincoln, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. The 19th Amendment is part of that new birth of freedom that we still have to keep working for every day. All right. So that's the end of my formal talk. Um, are there any questions? Um, there is one in the chat, I'll read it. Um, this is from Howard. Um, the 13th Amendment still doesn't abolish involuntary servitude for convicted inmates. Should this be modified so that inmates are covered at least um, by minimum wage laws? It would allow restitution to any vict victims to be paid in a more timely and meaningful way instead of pen pennies on the dollar over long periods of time. Yeah, uh, I couldn't agree more about modifying the 13th Amendment. I'm not sure you want to put it up for an actual constitutional amendment change. I'm not sure what some people would want to do with it. Um, that language in the 13th Amendment was not well thought out. It came from language in the, um, in the Northwest Ordinance, um, which was written by actually Thomas Jefferson. And uh, it just kind of ended up in there. And the South, after Reconstruction, was able to use that to re-implement slavery by using the criminal codes, by criminalizing things like vagrancy or or being um, impolite or all kinds of things, truancy, et cetera. And basically put mostly black men back in bondage. And of course, the argument for the modern parallel is the disproportionate number of persons of color, young men principally of color, who end up in the criminal justice system and how that's justified by the 13th Amendment. Um, the uh, examples that you gave, I think were perfectly fine to look at and could be good solutions. I think that you need to get to the underlying problem and um, you know, the fact that people go to prison, it's a form of bondage. They need to go to prison for other reasons if they've committed crimes, but those social ills need to be attended to and doing some of the suggestions you just suggested is, is a perfectly fine start. Um, Kara put a question in the chat. Um, we women still need to pass the Equal Rights Amendment to have all women treated equally, your opinion? Uh, I always, <laughs> there is the argument that under the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, you've gotten in essence what the Equal Rights Amendment has, has, was in diet designed to do. I'm a full supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, to be a little bit, I don't mean to be trite with what the next thing I'm going to say or flip, but I kind of use, if a Martian came down to earth and read the Constitution, what would he read about women? okay, well, they have the right to vote, but are they equal? Well, I kind of think a Martian needs to read in there, oh yeah, everything that's great and said applies to women too. 
And I think the Equal Rights Amendment, if it does nothing else, it does that. Um, so, so absolutely. And uh, there's a lot of arguments right now about whether the states that ratified before, the ratification still counts, et cetera. Why this is an argument today, I'm not totally sure. It gets wrapped up in the argument about um, the right to an abortion or not, and it's all mucked up. But on its very terms, it seems to me to be a no-brainer. All right, uh, Kay has a question in the chat. Um, she just finished reading the book, Cast, uh, Cast with an E, um, by Isabel Wilkerson. It seems that many people may have rights, but they are still not recognized by many. Yeah. The greatness of the American Constitution, and it's like I said at the start, we have our aspirations, but we have our failures. But at least we have a foundation that, you know, the issue is not creating rights, the issue is getting them recognized. And that's the struggle that, that, uh, that we can never give up. Okay. Um... As Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of history bends towards justice. Uh, I just wish the curb was not quite as long. Yeah. Um, someone put another question in the chat. Uh, Rivon, um, I'm just guessing on the pronunciation. I apologize if I'm bad at that. Uh, asks, asks you to please explain your working definition of racism. Huh. Well, like I said, anybody who denies the Gettysburg Address will start with that. Um, and then... Um, you know, anybody who makes a presumption about people based on their, the color of their skin or their cultural backgrounds and somehow views them as less or not entitled to the same thing that Americans have a right to, um, that would be as good as any. Uh, I think there's great minds who have worked on that, but at the very least, if you can't get that straight, then that's a working definition of racism. Uh, in the context of this cl class and this talk, uh, to deny that equality and freedom are not inextricably connected, that is racism. Yeah, thank you. Um, ROSRNS, I'm guessing that's Ros RNS, uh, asks, when will we when will we get the Harriet Tubman twenty dollar bill? <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a big move, especially among Native Americans, to dump Andrew Jackson. Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, and put Harriet on there. Uh, I would love to see a Harriet Tubman. The Susan B. Anthony dollar. I've got a bunch of those. I find them convenient, but most people don't find a, a dollar coin to be convenient. Um, Although when you think about it, when you used to buy a Coca-Cola, it was 25 cents. Now it's pretty much a dollar. You should probably get back to that. But I think a dollar bill would be would be good. Uh, I would not advocate, however, replacing Ulysses S. Grant on the 50 because Ulysses S. Grant is an underappreciated president when it comes to racial justice issues. Uh, Andrew Jackson had his strong points, but race racial issues was not one of them, especially towards Native Americans. As many of you know, there are still Native Americans uh, reservations that will not accept a twenty-dollar bill. <laughs> oh, really? Really? Yeah. Nor should they. Um, Howard asked, uh, "Can a president pardon himself? Can he be impeached after his term is over?" <laughs> oh, we had to get back to that, didn't we? <laughs> um, I will give you a quick. Um, argument. We could definitely have a whole talk on this, all that's bubbling around right now. Just on that question, uh, if I was Donald Trump's criminal lawyer, I would first of all charge a huge retainer um, payable upon receipt and several Gosh, clauses that <laughs> up front and several clauses that said as soon as he pissed me off, I could get withdraw from his reputation and keep all the money. But I would advise him, do not pardon yourself because a pardon by definition is an admission of guilt. Remember Joe Arpaio was confronted with that. You know, he said, oh, you, I didn't say I didn't. Yeah, you accepted a pardon, moron. That means you've accepted guilt. 
which means that if a later court, you say you pardon yourself and then you're charged with that crime, a later court could come in and say, no, you can't pardon yourself just as a matter of the English grammar, which means you have just entered an admission of guilt and not received the benefit of a pardon. So if I was his lawyer, I would say, Donald, do not pardon yourself. It could be the dumbest legal move you would have made. All right. I will tell you what I personally am worried about, which is until January 20th at 12 noon sharp, he still is president of the United States, barring the 25th Amendment or, or an impeachment that would be conviction, right? Um, and he could give a general amnesty to all the people who participated on January 6th in the storming of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I think would be horrible um, in some ways. In the other ways, there is a good outcome from all of this. Um, it would further cement the issues. Um, I, I, if I may indulge me just a second, I've been thinking a lot about what happened on the 6th. And um, for four years, we have been the clarion calls about how bad this person is as president. I have. I, I don't know if everybody on this Zoom meeting shares my views, but, but uh, for constitutional structure and government, um, he's terrible for the Republican Party, for instance. But the institutions have held, and they've held because people behind the scenes have worked hard to make them hold. I'm sure there's generals that have more respect for democracy than he ever did, who've held it together. There have been people in government and the State Department and held it together. What happened on the 6th was something finally broke. And that was the sanctity of the United States Capitol not being invaded by a mob that wanted to subvert democracy. And the reaction to that is what given, has given me reason to feel kind of better, uh, reason for hope is okay, something actually finally did break and it's horrible. And, um, and several Republicans are finally standing up. Even Mitch McConnell made a speech affirming the value of American democracy. So when you even get Mitch McConnell to do that, I think that's remarkable and something to look at with hope. So, um, so something finally broke and fortunately it wasn't the protocol for the nuclear codes and the sanctity of the Capitol broke, and that's that. And by the way, Cory Booker said this, but I also said it independently. Um, this is not the first time in American history that the sanctity of the Capitol had been invaded. Um, the first time was in 1812, and it was done by the British, and they were wearing red too. Um. Gail asks, um, could you return to talk to us after the current debate about using the 25th Amendment or about <laughs> using impeachment um, to talk about uh, keeping this mess from happening again? I would be happy to. The interesting thing about this is there's all kinds of interesting constitutional issues and unprecedented questions. One of which is uh, if you impeach a person who's already out of office, can you, um, the second part of that constitutional provision in article two that talks about impeachment for high crimes and misdemeanors said that they can, a person be, can be precluded from ever holding a position of honor or, or trust or, or office essentially. Uh, that's been used for the impeachment after, I don't know, several federal judges who were impeached and then they were precluded. The vote for preclusion is a simple majority, not the, um, what is it, three fifths or two thirds vote for, conviction in the Senate. And the question is, well, can somebody have out of office um, who hasn't been removed by impeachment, but is removed because his term has ended, can then that be done and can he be precluded forever from running for office in that context has never happened before. So there's a lot of unprecedented constitutional issues bubbling around the impeachment clause. And as far as the 25th Amendment Clause, um, that's problematic, but Mike Pence and 13 members of the cabinet, of which there are, what, 24, um, there's a lot of issues there. They could uh, suspend him from being president until the Congress meets within 21 days. Well, within 21 days, you're going to have Joe Biden's inauguration. Um, but I guess that also raises a question, given that 
several members of his cabinet are not confirmed by the Senate and have not been or only acting, uh, can they sign that under the 25th Amendment? So 25th Amendment works really good when the president is shot and in a coma like John F. Kennedy. It does not work particularly well for a president who's losing his marbles or was crazy in the first place. So if, if there are maybe only a couple of cabinet members plus Mike Pence, like could those four or five people invoke the 25th? Not when they invoke it, but to make it work, you need Pence, you need the vice president and 13 others. Oh, you need 13? Right. But 13. if there aren't even 13 uh, full confirmed cabinet members, then... I don't know. No. <laughs> okay. Now, in terms of the acting of the 25th Amendment in this context, the only precedent would be um, episode 88 of West Wing. This happened. And the movie Air Force One with Harrison Ford. Remember, he's up on Air Force One with a bunch of terrorists, and they're down on the ground having the 13th Amendment. And I guess there was an episode of Veep with Mary, Mary Louise Dreyfus on there. Uh, that's the only way the, third, the 25th Amendment has actually worked in this context was there. Um, in real life, it hasn't so far. The, uh, the last question that I see at the moment is from Roz RNS again. Um, is there any hope that the Repub Republican Party can live up to its namesake? Huh. Uh, <laughs> it's an utter shame that the party of Lincoln has lived to repudiate pretty much everything that Lincoln and uh, Ulysses S. Grant implemented in Stanford. Remember, under Ulysses S. Grant and the Republican Congress, uh, they passed the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, which was designed to go into the South and educate and enfranchise Black people in a way that, that um, affirmative action is small potatoes compared to that. And this was under the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which they also passed at that time. This was the party that, that, that did the great things. Um, I have a kind of a theory that the many of the arguments about Republicans opposition to slavery had to do with the future economic growth of the United States, that slavery was anathema to a free market with free labor and, and the growing needs of the economy and the industrial revolution. And I think those are arguments are correct. So many of the Republicans adhere to that under those arguments, and they may not have been that interested in racial equalities, others certainly were. Um, and so it was the ending of slavery, the 13th Amendment that had the most commitment, and that somehow that interests of the Republican parties in the expansion of uh, the economy and business and, and the growth of the economy of the nation has taken over from their opposition initially to uh, slavery and racial injustice because of that foundation. Um, just to give you one example, you know, Abraham Lincoln was actually the one that started and laid the groundwork for the Transcontinental Railroad. So in addition to fighting the Civil War, he also laid the groundwork for that to happen, um, which is, you know, with less than a decade, we had the Transcontinental Railroad in the United States, which was crucial to the expansion of the country and the economic good of the country, so. All right, uh, are there any, uh, any more questions from anyone? Okay. Okay. Um, this uh, talk will eventually probably be an article form in the Arizona attorney. If you want to send me your membership list, I'll put you on my list to send out a copy of the article when I get it written. So, okay. Um, if you, if you contact one of us on the board, uh, we'll be able to forward it. Okay. Thanks for all your help, Oliver. All right. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for coming and uh, giving us your presentation. My great pleasure. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, it's good to see you, and uh, um, it's good to have so many. I think this is the most that we've had on Zoom. I saw up to uh, 39, I think. Yeah.